We're continuing in our series on Joshua tonight. Please turn with me in your Bibles to chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10 and starting from verse 1. Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hohem, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Machedah. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till a nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Machedah. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Machedah, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop, pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites destroyed them completely, almost to a man, but the few who were left reached their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Machedah, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, 
he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. That day, Joshua took Machedar. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Machedar as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Machedar to Libna and attacked it. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it, Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there. And he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. He took up positions against it and attacked it. The Lord handed Lachish over to Israel and Joshua took it on the second day. The city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam king of Giza had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lachish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. They captured it that same day and put it to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it, just as they had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword, together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors. Just as at Eglon, they totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned round and attacked Debir. They took the city, its king, and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Debir and its king, as they had done to Libna and its king and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathe, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. This is God's word. Am I coming through? Well, it's been uh, seven months of preaching to a camera lens, so this is really beautiful. <laughs> so it's great that we can be uh, together. Uh, we are still obviously going through uh, Joshua, but tonight we really have uh, God front and centre in this passage. And 
And really, uh, God is shown in this passage as wonderful to his people, but he is shown as terrifying uh, to his enemies. So we need to kind of strike that balance tonight as we work through this text. But before we jump in, let's pray and ask our Lord for his help. Heavenly Father, we are so privileged uh, to be able to gather tonight. Uh, it seems that it's only, uh, we've only been able to realize this uh, once it's been taken from us. And we just want to offer up our praise to you now and worship and thanksgiving that you have brought us back and that you've returned us. And thank you that we can be together like this, uh, that your bride can be together and that we can worship you together, not uh, in isolation Father, we pray as we open up your word tonight, uh, I pray that Christ would really be lifted up. Uh, May you reveal him, and God, may you uh, be working in our hearts, uh, and Lord, open our minds to see what you have to say for us. And I pray, O God, that you would put a great restraint on Satan tonight, uh, that you would withhold him, that you would not give him free roam in this place to snatch the word. But I pray that you would guard your people, and that you'd be preparing the soil in our hearts to receive your truth, what you would have for us even in this moment, that we might bear fruit to your glory. Lord, we ask all of this knowing that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon this room even now. So we call upon you and we pray all this for the glory of your Son. Amen. Well, last week, uh, just the context here, Gibeon, that great nation, had found out what Israel was up to and how they were conquering the land so they come up and they really raise the white flag and they surrender in a sense and they are willing to be Israel's servants so that they're not wiped out. That's really the context uh, here. So Gibeon has made a treaty with Israel. But in our passage, if you've got the text open, it'll be really helpful because we're going to reference it a lot uh, tonight. Uh, Firstly, I want us to see uh, here sinners at war with God. Sinners at war with God. Now, the first character that we're introduced to in chapter 10 is the king of Jerusalem. But don't be confused by that. That's not an Israelite king. Israel hasn't taken Jerusalem yet. This is a pagan king of Jerusalem. So we're introduced to him. And it says the very first words there, Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it. Now that phrase there is very significant because chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 all begin with the same phrase. If you've got it in front of you, have a look. Chapter 9, Now when all the kings of west of the Jordan heard about these things. Chapter 10, When Adonai, Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard these things. Chapter 11, when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this. What's going on? God's fame is spreading through the land of Canaan. They are hearing about the power of Yahweh, this God that they previously didn't know about, and they're hearing what he's doing through his people Israel. And news is spreading It says Adonai Zedek and his people became alarmed. They were afraid. Why? Because Israel just totally wiped out Ai, the city of Ai. And they did to Ai what they just did to Jericho. And the city of Gibeon was even more mighty and greater than Ai. And Gibeon raised the white flag and surrendered. So the king of Jerusalem, he's thinking in his head, If Gibeon has surrendered, who on earth can stand against Yahweh and Israel? So he's panicking and he's freaking out. Joshua has conquered the east. He's conquered much of the west and he's conquered much of the center region of Canaan. And now all that's left under Adonai Zedek's reign is kind of the southern region. He's losing everything. And so fear comes upon the king of Jerusalem. And now he's faced with a dilemma. He's really faced with, uh, he's at a crossroads here because he knew what Yahweh had done to the Egyptians and how he had parted the Red Sea. And he knew that Yahweh was fighting for one nation only, Israel. And so he's faced at this crossroads. He's got two options. 
Do I surrender, seek mercy, plead for grace, as it were, like Rahab and like Gibeon? Or do I somehow manage to come up with a plan to stand against Yahweh, to overthrow him and to stop this force and resist him? So what does Adonai Zedek choose? Look at verses 3 to 5. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up, help me and attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. What option does he take? Resist Yahweh. He goes for option two. Now he requests that the four nearby kings in the surrounding areas join forces with him to become allies, to punish Gibeon and to fight against God. And so an alliance of five kings is forged here and they attack the city of Gibeon. Now this really, this here is a picture. This shows us the hard, rebellious, stubborn, resistant, defying heart that marks human beings. This resistance to God, an unwilling to yield, an unwilling to submit. They do not want Yahweh over them. Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations rage and why do they plot a thing in vain against the Lord and against his anointed? It's always been this way. Man does not want God over them. And so make no mistake, as you read this, this is a war against God, the true God. And notice the author's detail. In in verses 3 and 5, he gives a full description of the five kings. He does it in verse 3, giving all their names and where they're from. And then in verse 5, two verses later, he gives a full description of them again. Why does he do that? Why, Why does he give this full description? Is the author just really wordy? Does he think in verse 5 that we've forgotten who the kings are that he just mentioned two verses earlier? Why does he do that? He's trying to show us the overwhelming odds that are now against Gibeon. He he wants to show that there are now five kings against one. There are five armies against one. This is impossible odds. Gibeon's destruction is absolutely certain here. Verse 6 Gibeon sends message to Israel for aid, right? They're in a treaty with him now, and so they cried to Israel for help to come and join the battle. And the five kings would have expected this because they knew that Gibeon had surrendered to Israel. They were expecting this, yet even if Israel joins, it doesn't really improve the odds, does it? It's still five kings against two kings. It's still five armies against two armies. That's still pretty good odds. So Adonai Zedek's plan seems wise. Strength in numbers. Really, statistically, they can't lose. On paper, they can't lose. Such is the problem, though, with man's wisdom. It seems right. It seems like it's going to work. And yet when God's in the equation, statistics mean nothing. Man at war with God. Secondly, I want you to see God at war with sinners Israel answers Gibeon's SOS call. They receive the call and they answer, and Joshua fulfills his obligations. Now, Joshua and the Israelites, when they got this SOS to join the battle, this would have been fearful and frightening for them, even though God had helped them so far. They are still one army going against five. It would be two against five. But think as a soldier, war is scary any time. Even if you've got more numbers than the opposition. Imagine going out to battle knowing there's two of you and there's five armies standing waiting. It would have been frightening. And yet in that very moment as they headed to the city, the word of God comes. Like a cool breeze in the desert. Look at the word of God in verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. You see, the word 
that would calm every fear, the word that would cast out all doubt, the word that would strengthen weak knees and stabilize shaky hearts. It comes from God himself to his people. And what God says there in verse 8 is exactly the same as what God says to Joshua all the way back in chapter 1, verse 5. Same phrase. It's the same promise. What do we learn about God here? He reinforces his promises to us. He reinforces them. Listen, when we come to church, when we gather at church, or when you gather in your Bible study group, more often than not, you hear things that you already know. Sometimes you hear something new from the pulpit, but mostly you hear things that you know, but we need those things that we know freshly applied. We need them reinforced. We need to be reminded of them, and when, it, when that happens, it encourages us, it strengthens us, it solidifies us in what we believe. You see, to Joshua, God says, don't be afraid, I'm with you. In the New Testament, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 28, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Joshua had the audible voice of God come to him. We have the living voice of God on record for us. It's what we need, and it needs to be reinforced. And notice what the promise reveals about God. Verse 8, it shows so much about who God is and what he's able to do. The promise, look what he says. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. God doesn't just say, Joshua, I'll be with you. Joshua, I'll help you so that you win. No, no, he says, I have given them into your hands. Think about that statement. Israel isn't even in battle yet. They haven't even drawn swords. The war that they're part of hasn't started yet. And God speaks of the battle in the past tense. How can he do that? I have given them into your hands. It's already done. Go and walk into it and receive it. This is who God is. He can literally take five armies of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and he can just give them over. It's as easy for him as taking out the rubbish. It's as easy for him as moving a chess piece. You heard Will, if you were here this morning, in his prayer, quoted Isaiah chapter 40, where it says, the nations are but a drop in a bucket to you. They are as nothing to you. They are as dust on the scales. That's how great God is and his power is. And Christian, when we look at this, this is the God that is for you, who is on your side, who fights for you. See it played out. Look at verse 10. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who then defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. God enters the battle and he completely throws the armies into confusion, into chaos, into panic and disorder, the word means. So Israel then fights and they win this great battle at Gibeon. They win it. But notice the author's emphasis here. He doesn't just simply say that Israel won because of the sovereign determination of God. God planned it, so it happened. The author doesn't settle for that. The author doesn't just describe God as the one who moves the chess pieces. We must not miss his emphasis here. Look at verse 11. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. See the author's emphasis here? In this battle, who racks up the most kills? It's God. It's God, and he is shown here, the scene that we get is is God hurling down hailstones at his enemies, and he's hurling them with accuracy, and he's hurling them with the divine intent to kill, and he didn't miss. He didn't miss. The Lord hurled down hailstones, and more of them died from the hail than the swords of the Israelites. What does the author want us to see here? What does he want us to see? This is God as 
warrior. This is God as warrior. He fought for Israel. Two other times in the text, it says that God fought for Israel. It finishes the story. God fought for Israel. This is a common theme in the Old Testament. God as warrior. Let me quote you a few verses. Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior with a shout. He'll raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. And Psalm 24, who is this king of glory? It's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The Lord is a warrior. Why am I emphasizing this point here? Not just because the author's emphasizing it, but we here, the modern church, the modern church is in great danger of creating God in our own image. We are anti-war. Mostly, and for mostly for good reasons, because it's obviously obviously, most of the time it happens from bad motives. But we are in danger of stripping God's identity from him in our worship. 21st century Sunday schools would much rather teach on the God over the rainbow rather than the God as warrior. It's much more palatable. When we read the Ten Commandments, do not make a graven image of God. With pride, we can say we would never, I thank God that we would never make God an image of God. That's what we would say. And yet, are we in danger of recreating God in our own image, not with our hands, but with our minds and our conceptions of Him, changing Him? And what's even worse... What's even worse than what we do with God is how Jesus is spoken of today. Jesus is how Jesus is viewed in the church today. Listen to the rebuke of a theology professor as he writes to the modern church. Let me quote him. He says this, The popular image of Jesus is that he is not only kind and tender, but also soft and prissy. As though Jesus comes to us reeking of hand cream. End quote. What a rebuke. Is that the kind of saviour that you want? I want no part of a Jesus like that. Why do I want no part of a Jesus like that? Because how is Satan described in in the Bible? He's described as a roaring lion who has an insatiable appetite for lamb. For God's sheep. He's described as a great dragon who terrorizes this world. He's described as the deadly serpent. Understand, Satan hates you. And he wants to lure you and tempt you onto the broad way so that you will spend eternity in hell. He wants you to blaspheme God. He wants to ruin you. A prissy Jesus will not help us. It will not. Satan is described in such in detail. And Jesus, you know, he's, he's so often talked about today. Just go on YouTube and, and, and the modern church today. He's got soft hair and he wouldn't step on a flower. Who do we need? Better yet, who do the scriptures say that we have? Let me read to you Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
and he will never reject a broken and repentant sinner who comes to him. Never. And if you come to him humbly, he will never throw your sin in your face. He will never laugh at you. And he will embrace you. He will adopt you and bring you into his family. And he will shower you with unconditional love for all of eternity. But that same Prince of Peace is also a warrior. And his robe is dipped in blood. And he will ride out and strike down the nations. And he will wreak vengeance on his enemies. He fights for his people. And those who are not on his side, he will strike down in his anger. This is who he is. Christian, this warrior is for you. And he fights for you. He fights for you. But he is a warrior. Well, not only did God use hailstones to fight, but he also uses the sun and moon. Look at verses 12 to 13. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nations avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Joshua. This is an amazing miracle. This is the longest day in the history of the world that we have recorded, the longest day in history. Now, what's the point of this supernatural event, of this supernatural long day? What's the point? God wants to give Israel enough time to win the battle in the day. Five armies they need to beat and slay, five. And he extends the day so they can do it in one hit. Now, in the context, even in ancient times, the sun was used by people to measure time and to mark out the seasons. And the moon was used to measure time and to mark out the seasons. Now, skeptics and critics of the Bible, they look at a passage like this and they completely disregard it as absolute fiction. That the sun stood, stood still in the sky and, and the moon stood still. Primary schoolers know that the sun doesn't move. It's the earth that moves around it. Primary schoolers know more than what your divine God-breathed book knows. And they absolutely mock it. But is the Bible trying to give us here a science lesson of the event? Or is it trying to show us, is it painting what was happening as they were looking at this phenomenon? What are they doing? And, and what's even more interesting is we use the same language. Us 21st century smart people, we use the same language today, don't we? Look, the sun's going down. It's about to go down. What do we call it? Sunrise, sunset. Check your weather app. And yet the Bible is absolutely mocked here. What's going on? If we want some kind of scientific explanation of what God's doing supernaturally, if anything scientific is happening here, God is slowing the, the rotation of the earth. He's slowing it down. And again, skeptics say, fine, but that's even more ridiculous because if God slowed the rotation of the earth, then catastrophic events would happen. There'd be tsunamis, there'd be earthquakes. The world would just absolutely collapse and implode, as it were. And so they mock it. And yet... This isn't ridiculous for Christians, is it? We're used to this kind of power, aren't we? You don't get into Christianity without, without being introduced to this power because you just open up your Bible and you introduce it on the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He speaks and the blazing sun appears. He speaks and constellations and galaxies are flung out. We're used to this power. It's not ridiculous to us. See, the same God who suspended the laws of nature to allow Peter to walk on the raging sea, he's able to suspend the laws of nature and slow the earth down so that he can ensure his people got enough time to defeat the enemy. It's no problem for him. It's no problem for him. But isn't it fascinating what everyone's mind is just absolutely blown and everyone's puzzled by? We're puzzled by the sun stopping and the moon stopping. That's not what puzzles the author. Did you notice? He's not puzzled by that. What's the author puzzled by? Look at verse 14. There's never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. There's the shock. That's, that's the surprise in the passage. Not the sun standing still, not the moon standing still. Joshua speaks to God, and then Joshua speaks to the sun and the moon, and God listens 
and acts upon what Joshua says. There's the surprise. And the author is left in awe. And you and I, we should have the same awe within us that the Almighty God should bend His knee and listen to us. That He listens to us when we pray and He listens attentively and He listens lovingly. There is the absolute shock. The prayers that you utter at your desk, the prayers that you can barely, that are all muffled because you're crying so much, he listens. The prayers that you're praying for your dysfunctional family, your broken marriage, he's listening lovingly and attentively. He listens to all these prayers. When Nathan walks up the steps to preach and he's asking for help, he's listening What is Nathan that he should listen to my prayers? Who are you that he should pay any attention? Who are you that he should take time to listen to your requests? He's so glorious. He's so inconceivable. He's so wonderful. You have to pinch yourself to see if you're not dreaming. I don't want the Muslim God who promises me a bunch of virgins in paradise. I don't want the Hindu gods who ensure karma so that I reap what I sow. I want the God of Scripture. He's incredible. He listens to sinners lovingly and attentively. And the author's puzzled that God listened to a man. Why did God listen to Joshua? Because it says, surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Why does he listen to us? Because the Lord is for us. He's for us. Well, in verse 15, the end of the battle is stated. Joshua returning with Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now, that's the end of the battle. The summary version. Now, he wants to focus in on some of the details of that battle. And here is where it gets really interesting. Because he goes back to the battle. But he wants to focus on something. The next point I want us to see is a visible sign that promises victory. And this is from verses 16 to 27. Now, at this point, the author returns to the main characters that he opened with. Remember? I hope you haven't forgotten about them. Look at verse 16. He circles back. Now, the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda. The camera focuses back in on the instigators who sought to fight against Yahweh, who wouldn't yield and wouldn't submit, and the camera's focused on them, and now they see that they've lost. They realize that they've lost the battle and they're on the run. They flee and hide in a cave. Now here is man's wisdom. It seemed like the perfect hiding spot. It seemed like they were safe. It seemed like they would be rescued. Look at verses 17 and 18. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makeda, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. Do you remember what we saw back in verse 8? I have given them into your hand. He's not just talking about the armies. He's talking about the kings. I've given them into your hand. And God says, hey, by the way, they're hiding in the cave. They're hiding in the cave. Now imagine the shift on the faces of these kings. They manage to flee from the battle and they're hiding in this cave and they think they see light at the end of the tunnel. Then they hear voices and then they hear the sound of rocks being rolled to the mouth of the cave at the entrance. And the place that they thought was their safe haven ended up becoming their prison, which would seal their doom. You see man's wisdom? Do you see man's wisdom? What they put their trust in ensured their doom. That is God. That is absolutely God. You need to understand when God is against you, your greatest plans, the things that you trust in, he will use them to bring about your downfall. He will ruin you with them. This is exactly what it says in Proverbs 14, 12. You know the verse. There is a way that appears to be right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. There was a way that seemed right to these five kings that seemed safe, and it led to death, literally. Literally. That great hymn reminds us there's only one place to stand firm. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. 
all other ground is sinking sand. Is Jesus for you or is he against you? But there's an important visual sign here. I said, Israel continues to pursue them. They put the rocks at the entrance of the cave and they're told to keep pursuing the remaining people who are on the run. And they slice them up and they kill them. They cut them down. And then they come back to the cave at Makeda. They come back where the five kings are waiting in terror in the darkness. What's going to happen to them? Joshua orders, bring out the five kings. Bring them out. And so they're summoned. And look at verse 24. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. See, this was an ancient practice, putting your foot on the neck of your enemy. But you know who used to do that? Kings used to do that to their enemies. And now these commanders, they're told to put their feet on the necks of kings. Can you imagine what an experience that would have been for them? Stepping on the necks of these mighty kings. Joshua says, do it. Do it. But understand, when Joshua tells him to do this, he's not like the ancient kings, and he doesn't do it for the reasons that they do it. This isn't Joshua boasting or gloating in pride that he's defeated his enemies. He's not doing that. How do I know that? Because Joshua adds a little sermonette to this neck treading. He gives a little sermon. Look at verse 25. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. This is what God's going to do. See, this this treading, this was a visual sermon for the people of Israel. This is what God is going to do for you. He's reinforcing the promise. I already told you I'm going to give your enemies into your, hand, into your hands. But now I want to show you visibly with this sign. I want you to see it with your eyes. This is what I'm going to do in the future. This gruesome scene was to give them courage and hope and confidence in God. What's so amazing is when you read Genesis chapter 3, God says to Eve, your seed and offspring is going to step on the head of Satan. And when you read Psalm 101, a prophecy about the Messiah, God speaks about his son and says, wait here, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Till I make your enemies your footstool. These commanders experience a foretaste of what the Messiah would do to his enemies, to Satan and unbelievers. It's a glorious picture. But the visual sign is intensified. Joshua kills them. He hangs them on trees. And at sunset, he takes their, bo- their bodies down and throws them back in the cave where they were hiding. Now notice the detail, verse 27. Look at the last line there. At the mouth of the cave, they place lar- large rocks which are there to this day. Now the author is tipping us off here. If you've been following us through Joshua, rocks have played a big part of this book, haven't they? There have been rock memorials that God has wanted to set up. Remember when they crossed the Jordan and God said, take rocks from the Jordan and set them up in Gilgal and they'll be a reminder to you of my faithfulness, how I brought you across the sea. And do you remember when Achan sinned and he stole the thing from Jericho and he hid it under his tent? God told them to kill him. And then what did they do? Put a pile of rocks upon Achan, upon his corpse. And that will always be a reminder of what happens when you disobey me. Let it forever be a reminder of my justice. Rock memorials. And here they put rocks at the cave. Why do they put rocks at the cave? The kings can't escape anymore. They're dead. There's just corpses in there. Why do they put rocks at the cave? A continual reminder at Makeda, what God did. A visual reminder what he's done and a promise for the future. This was a sermon for the eyes, not for the ears. A sermon for the eyes. Christian, God has left us two visual reminders, two visual memorials, and they're not Christmas and Easter. I said it a number of weeks back. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, these visual reminders of what God has done for us and what we've been brought into. And the Lord's Supper, we're going to get to 
partake of tonight and be reminded of tonight. It is this precious gift to Christ's bride, something that you can see, something that you can touch, something that you can taste. His visual gift for us with the purpose of reminding us. What does he want to remind us? That he has saved us, that he has made us the many, one, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it came at great cost. What does it remind us? When we take communion, it reminds us that our necks, our necks were under God's foot. Our necks were under there. But what happened? What happened? Someone else's neck went under there. Someone else was crushed. Let me read it. Isaiah 53, 5 and 10. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. He was trodden under by the Father. His neck under the foot of his Father as a sin offering. And so Jesus says to us, this is my body for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Take and eat, take and drink, and remember me. Proclaim my death till I come back. This is the visual memorial for us. This is the thing that our children have to see. They have to see us. What this is all about. Unbelievers will watch on and they'll see all these people knit together around the Lord's table. They'll see this. But understand, unbelievers can never get their heads around how a pile of rocks can comfort and reassure God's people. They can't wrap their heads around it. Just in the same way, unbelievers can never wrap their heads around how the bread and the wine bring so much comfort and reassurance to us. They'll never be able to fathom that. But we know, don't we? We know how beautiful that visual sermon is, don't we? And we rejoice in it. So you can even prepare your hearts now. You can even prepare your hearts now. And just lastly, I'm going to close on this. I just want to mention it really briefly. God's promise is fulfilled. After this battle here, we read of Joshua and Israel destroying another six cities. And the author just goes bang, 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 bang. Six cities and seven kings. Now each battle says the same thing. Israel completely killed everyone. Everyone. And it's continually reinforced by the author. Just look at verse 40. Look what he says in verse 40. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes together with all their kings. He left no survivors. Here it is. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Now the author acquits Joshua of being being a bloodthirsty tyrant because it says they did everything that the Lord had commanded. This is the author actually commending the Israelites for this complete massacre. Now, this is really, really tough. This is hard to swallow. Guys, this is men, this is women, this is children completely slaughtered. This is one of the toughest things to accept in the scriptures. Atheists like Richard Dawkins pounce on passages like this and they call the God of the Bible a megalomaniac, a genocidal maniac. And they look at these texts. This is really tough. Now I'm not going to spend time on it because I think Pastor Ian has has really explained it and has, has gone into it and explain why God has done this. I just want to add one thing. Let me add one thing with this. One of the most common questions that generations ask is, if God is good, if God is loving, why does he allow so much evil and suffering in the world, right? If he is good and he's loving, how come he does it? It seems incompatible with a good and loving God to allow such evil, right? You heard that. I've heard that a million times. What's the answer to that question? What happens when God gets rid of all the evil in the world? What does it look like? It looks like the flood. What does it take? It takes something like the flood, where humanity is brought to the point of extinction, just about. What's the problem? Evil in the world, what's the problem? 
It's me. It's everyone in this room. It's men, it's women, and understand, it's children. What do I mean by that? Children are born with a sinful nature. And they will rise up and they will grow to hate and disobey God like every other human. And so, what we have here is God doing a purging. God doing a purging in the earth. He's giving justice and he's pouring out judgment against evil. We want God to rid evil from the world. This is what happens. This is what happens. God had a threefold purpose in this. To punish sinners, to purge the land, and to bless his people by fulfilling his promises and giving them the land. That's his threefold purpose. This is our God. This is our God. Let me close with verse 42. Verse 42. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. This is our God, the warrior God, and he fights for us. Are you on his side? Are you on his side? Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we just thank you for your word. Even as we dive into the Old Testament and some of these hard passages, it is just saturated, saturated with the gospel. We find Christ everywhere. We see everything. We we see all these things working through. We see the thread of the story all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your precious word. God, I pray these things that we've learned about you, may they sober us. And I pray that we wouldn't be guilty of recreating you in our own image. Something that is more palatable to this world. But God, help us to stand in awe and marvel and thank you that you did not tread us, but you showed us mercy and you crushed your son. You poured your judgment upon him. We thank you that we can even now partake of this visual sermon that you prepare for us. You dress up this table has been all prepared by your son. And I just pray, Lord, that you would remind us afresh of what you have done, of your promises, of how you have loved us, how you have made us one in Christ and the hope that Christ is coming back for us. Lord, we thank you for these visual reminders. And we praise you and we worship you in the name of your Son. Amen.